Hi, everyone. I want to welcome you to Biographical Portraits as a World History Lens. This is the third and final installment of Primary Sources Fall webinar series for teachers of world history and other they're interested educators, and it's so nice to be back with you again tonight. To this evening, we'll be examining gender and power in the early modern world through a biography cluster, a group portrait, you might say, of women rulers from the early modern era. And we are so fortunate to have as our presenter this evening the truly distinguished scholar of gender in world history, Mary Wiesner Hanks, who's joining us from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. And hello, Professor Wiesner Hanks. Thank you so much for coming tonight, and we welcome you to Primary Source. We're really excited to be speaking with you this evening. I'm Susan Zeiger. I'm a program director at Primary Source, and I'll be introducing Mary Wiesner Hanks more formally in just a few moments. But let me say first that the webinar this evening is part of a three part series um, this fall that we've sponsored, analyzing diverse figures in world history from 1200 to 1600 CE. We set out to explore what a single eventful life can tell us about important themes in the making of our global world. And by the end of tonight, I think we'll have encountered really every one of the five themes of world history in a new and fascinating way from um, across the, the series, from the interaction of humans and the environment and the evolution of family and kinship networks in Mongol history, which was presented to us um, so eloquently and in, in such a fascinating way by Professor Morris Rasabi back in October to the expansion of economic systems and the passage of important cultural ideas, cross-cultural exchange across the trade routes of the medieval Muslim world, which was our topic last um, month with Professor Ross Dunn, and tonight to understanding the cultural and political power that women wielded in many early modern societies, and that will be presented um, for us by Professor Mary Wiesner Hanks this evening. For our participants tonight, as soon as the recording from this session is ready, we'll email you the link that will come along with the instructions for posting your last reflection comments and claiming your professional development hours from us. So we hope all of that has worked smoothly for you. That reminds me as well to welcome all of you who are joining us from many parts of the region. And thank you for taking the time to be with us this evening. Later in the hour tonight, we'll have a designated block of time for your questions and comments, but we do encourage you to begin entering whatever thoughts or questions occur to you as they do, and you can do that by using the chat box in the lower left of your computer screen. I think all of you are old hands at that by now, but um, just as a refresher, you type into the little um, box, uh, chat box in the bottom and then push enter, and your post will come up for all of us to see. We'd really love to know what drew you to the webinar this evening. I think there are some strong gender history fans in the audience tonight, I know, and we'd love to know what classroom connections you're excited to make coming out of what you learned tonight from our speaker. Toward the end of our evening, we'll also share some high-quality classroom resources that Primary Source has curated in conjunction with the session. If you have any questions at all, please write me at susan at primarysource.org, and I'll be glad to respond. And finally, a word about our organization, Primary Source is a nonprofit organization that partners with educators to bring global and cultural awareness into K-12 classrooms and schools and advance global education. We're an online resource center for global education, and we do professional development of many different varieties with teachers and schools. We welcome you to learn more about our work and join what we do, and I'll close out this evening by sharing some ways that you can do that. And now, I'd like to turn our attention to our topic for this evening. This is our chance to examine the surprisingly widespread role of political leadership held by women in a number of civilizations in the early modern era. 
um, this topic also turns out to tell us quite a lot about political culture and governance more broadly practiced by both men and women. And it's a great example of a comparative cross-cultural history topic, which is another approach to history um, and world history that we um, are seeing more widely used in K-12 schools. So to do those things, we turn to our presenter this evening. And I am so pleased to introduce to you now Mary Wiesner Hanks, who is a distinguished professor of history and women's and gender studies at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. She's the editor of the Journal of Global History, the editor in chief of the seven volume Cambridge World History, and the author and, uh, and her editor of 30 books and more than 100 articles or book chapters that have appeared in multiple languages in addition to English, German, French, Italian, Spanish, Chinese, Turkish, and Korean. There's truly global interest in the topics um, that um, Professor Lisa Hanks has been engaged in. Uh, her books include a concise history of the World coming out in 2015, came out in 2015, Gender in History, Global Perspectives, and the um, widely used and some very familiar, I'm sure to many of you, Women and Gender in Early Modern Europe, which is in its third edition. History education has also been a long-standing passion and interest of Mary's. She was the chief reader for Advanced Placement World History and is on the board for the Society of History Education. She's also written a number of innovative source books for use in the college and high school AP classroom, including Discovering the Global Past, a look at the evidence. She's the author as well of a book for young adults called An Age of Voyages. And um, she has been so active in the World History Association, is the incoming president of that um, esteemed group. And finally, I want to mention um, her 2009 critically acclaimed um, monograph, The Marvelous Hairy Girls, The Gonzalez Sisters and Their Worlds, which came out in 2009. This is a story of a family of extremely hairy people who lived in Europe in the late 16th century. And it was um, received glowing reviews from many publications, including the Times Literary Supplement and The New Yorker. So we'll hope to have a chance to speak with um, Professor Weezer Hinks a little bit later in the evening about all of that work and um, and and build on and respond to the presentation that she's about to share with us. So Mary, we're looking forward to your presentation very much. Would you like to turn on your sound? And let, I'll let you know if we can hear you. OK. How is, that, how is the sound working? Is that OK? You, you sound great. And welcome once again. And please feel free to begin. OK. Uh, welcome, everybody. And I see a couple of names on the list of people who are here who I might possibly know. So hi to all of you. Um, and I hope that, that we'll have an opportunity later that I'll be able to take your questions and, and go on from there. Um, what I am, uh, first of all, making sure that I can do all of the tech. This is a new tech scene to me, so I'm going to try to remember to do all of the various things at once. Uh, what I'm going to talk to today, or I'm going to do tonight, is look at a series of women uh, who lived in the early modern period, so roughly 1500 to 1800, a couple a little bit later, uh, who for one reason or another, or through some way or other, had political authority, who I call commanding queens. Two of the most prominent of those, one, uh, probably the best known of them, is Elizabeth I, who you see in the picture up on the right. Uh, that's a very famous portrait of her, the Armada portrait that was done after the Armada was defeated uh, or was blown away. Uh, and uh, Queen Amanatu on, uh, on the left, the lower left, uh, or she's also called Queen Amina sometimes of Sousa, um, which is part of Nigeria. Uh, but what I want, what I hope by the end of my talk, is, in the end of the presentation, is that you'll see that Elizabeth I, who's often described as the only queen ruling, was not alone. That there were many other women ruling around the world at roughly the same time in various kinds of capacities. So I'm going to do a formal talk. I'm going to read for a while, uh, a formal sort of a formal paper, a formal presentation, and show you some images uh, of these various queens and, and other royal royalty. And 
then after that, uh, we'll have uh, an opportunity for questions and answers. Uh, there is a group of readings uh, for this, a very short part of the chapter that I wrote about women's cultural power, gender and cultural power in global perspective from a recent collection. Um, so very short biographies of six of the women that I'm going to be talking about. There's taken from the Oxford Encyclopedia of Women in World History. So the kind of short biographies that you might encourage your students to write, those very short uh, kind of things. Um, and then two speeches of Queen Elizabeth I. It seemed that since I'm doing this uh, for primary source, that I should give you some primary sources. And since I believe in that in any way, I included two of Elizabeth I's most famous speeches, uh, speeches to Parliament uh, that she gave. Uh, but first, I'm going to read uh, for probably half an hour or so. Uh, and then we'll have time for questions after that. Um, so here we go. Um, the early modern world, so we're talking again roughly from 1500 to 1800, is often described as one of theater states in which rulers and the communities of individuals that surrounded them at court engaged in rituals and ceremonies through which they exercised and performed power. That's where the idea of theater comes from. It's this performance of power. They exercise power, they uh, exhibit power, but they also perform it. And the picture that you see here is one I couldn't resist. Even all the rest of the pictures will be, of, almost all the rest of the pictures will be of, of queens, of female rulers, but I couldn't resist a picture of Louis XIV uh, at Versailles because if anyone has performed power as he exercised power, he was it. Everything from his dress to his stance to his surroundings to everything was all about performance. These states, so the states of the early modern world, range from large centralized states in Europe, like France or like England, Japan, Central America, the Andean region, South Asia, and West Africa. Those are places where there were large centralized states, to much smaller states where courts grew around local power centers. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those. Courts had both practical and symbolic functions. They were places where authority was delegate, delegated through a hierarchy of offices of which Louis had hundreds and hundreds of people. They, you know, military and political decisions were made, which is usually what we think about rulers doing, and decrees and laws were issued. They were also centers of intense competition for power and prestige as officials, advisors, courtiers, generals, wives, and mistresses, and a host of other men and women jostled, plotted, and campaigned with and against one another. Courts were also sites of cultural production and consumption of ceremonies and activities through which people at the court simultaneously portrayed unity with the larger society under the beneficent rule of the monarch, so they showed off that they were France in Louis' case. And they also showed by all these fancy things they did that they were superior to anyone outside the court. Courts first developed in the millennium from 500 to 1500, so that medieval millennium, but reached their height of political and cultural power in the early modern period when rulers increasingly regarded it as important to demonstrate that alongside being able military leaders, which they still had to be, and Louis was, they were connected to cosmic social order, but they were also glorious and learned and godly, or sometimes godly. The vast majority of courts centered on hereditary dynasties in which authority was handed down from father to son or to another male descendant. That form and structure power that we're familiar with from world history since the agricultural revolution to today. So the most long-lasting kind of handing down of power. They, all of these courts developed in patriarchal societies in which most official positions were held by men. But, and the, today is about the but, individual women sometimes gained great political power either ruling in their own name as queens or empresses in places where this was possible, or more commonly, ruling in fact during the minority of a son or when their husbands were incapacitated or as influential consorts, so the wife of a king, during their husband's lifetime. Queen's regnant, so that's a queen who rules in her own right, that's what she's called. Queen consorts, that's the wife of a king. Queen mothers, the mother of the ruler and regents, who are usually guardians when during a minority or something, those kinds of ruling women collaborated with men in the transmission of dynastic power through official and unofficial channels and participated in the events that demonstrated their dominance. 
So here's one of those kinds of events. It's one of my favorite pictures of Queen Elizabeth dancing a dance called the Volta, in which people jump up into the air. You see her there um, dancing with Robert Dudley uh, at the English court. Um, there she is, of course, in the middle with her feet showing. It's a wonderful dancing design by a completely unknown artist. Not a terribly great artist, but it's a wonderful picture of court life. Women like Elizabeth and the other women I'm going to be talking about tonight had an also <coughs> had enormous cultural power, exerting artistic, literary, and religious patronage to shape the material culture and ritual life of courts. Because of their political and cultural power, the lives of these women have left many sources, which makes it possible for people to write at least short biographies, the kind like in the Oxford uh, History of, of, of Women, and sometimes very, very long biographies. Because early modern political history is so often conceptualized as kind of the rise of the nation state, that's what you talk about when you talk about the early modern period, especially in Europe. And because dynastic accidents, I mean by that by births, lack of births, deaths, left so many women in charge of those nation states of Western Europe, most of the studies that we have, the published studies we have of female rule in this era have focused especially on Western Europe, particularly the Tudor queens of England and especially Queen Elizabeth, and Queen Elizabeth I. In fact, Charles Beam and Carol Levin are editing an entire series called Queenship and Power, and you see two of the books from that series, which is published by Palgrave Macmillan. Now that series has 31 titles, of which 19 are on England, and eight are on Elizabeth I. You can probably tell from my voice that I think it ought to be a little more diverse. There are dozens of biographies of Elizabeth, written for children, young adults, general readers, and specialists. Hundreds of studies of all aspects of her reign, and films and television programs about her and her tumultuous family. In fact, I just learned about a huge elaborate board game called The Virgin Queen that takes two days to play that one of my students actually happens to play. What this means is if you want to use a biographical portrait as a world history lens, Elizabeth I works well because there's just so much available. She has, in fact, often been compared, and you see this in the original sources that I included in the packet for greetings. Elizabeth has, in fact, often been compared in meetings with her exact contemporary, the Mughal Emperor Akbar, who you see here, who rules almost exactly the same time that she does, 1556 to 1605. Here he is in a late 16th century portrait by a, a court artist named Manohar. Uh, Elizabeth in a 1575 portrait, it's called the Darnley portrait, not because it was for Lord Darnley, but Darnley was an owner. We don't know who painted this one either. Um, but uh, Elizabeth, actually there's contact between them. Elizabeth sent Akbar a letter in 1583. There was a chapter in a early kind of book about biographies in world history, Ken Wolf's Personalities and Problems in History, some of which you probably know. That comparison between Elizabeth and Akbar was picked up in countless AP world history guides. If you just type in Elizabeth and Akbar into Google, you get a month and all sorts of stuff. Um, the standard comparison between Elizabeth and Akbar highlights their relative religious toleration and their support for scholars and for trade. So they're a good comparison. I think, in fact, looking at these two pictures, that what the standard comparison misses is that they also occasionally dressed in very similar ways. I love the fact that the colors match and their, their dresses not particularly dissimilar. They're both wearing strands of pearls. That's what rulers do uh, in really quite lovely, elaborate court dress. But, okay, here's another but. Elizabeth doesn't have to be compared with a male ruler because Elizabeth was not the only female ruler in the early modern period. William Monter has recently examined 30 women who had sovereign authority over major European states in the era from 1300 to 1800. And so sovereign authority, not the wife of rulers, not a daughter, not a queen mother, but the actual ruler, including Elizabeth, of course, her half-sister Mary Tudor, Isabella of Castile, Catherine the Great of Russia, so names that you're probably familiar to, as well as less familiar rulers of Denmark, Sweden, Cyprus, Navarre, and the Habsburg lands. Perhaps surprisingly to those people who see the era as marked by a decline in women's independent agency, Monter finds that the political autonomy of Europe's royal heiress has increased in this period, which I think might explain why it's also that period saw such a vigorous and sometimes vicious debate about female rule. The most famous contributor to that debate was the Scottish reformer John Knox, 
who wrote the first blast of the trumpet against the monstrous regiment of women, um, which is a 500-page tirade against women's rule. He never got around to writing the second blast because then uh, he wrote it mostly against Mary Tudor. He hated Catholics. Uh, but Elizabeth came to reign and didn't like Knox, and he never wrote anything more. But that's only one. The debate, this debate about female rule, was actually one in what we would now today term the, about the social construction of gender, because writers in the debate discussed whether a woman's being born into a royal family and educated to rule, that's her class status, could or should allow her to overcome the limitations of her gender. So it's really about gender and class, so it's kind of about intersectionality as well, to put it in very modern terms. Okay. So along with Elizabeth, first to look for first at a couple of different people in Western Europe um, or in Central Europe. In Central Europe, the many regional states also centered on courts where women exerted significant political and cultural power. In Mantua, the, a state, one of the states of Northern Italy, for example, Isabella d'Este, uh, who is the noblewoman who is a ruler, and Francesco Gonzaga, their husband and wife, worked as a team in terms of artistic patronage and in governance, acting together strategically on the political and diplomatic stage, exchanging information, discussing tactics, building networks, engaging in intrigue and deception, and even plotting assassinations. Isabella, as you can see here in all of these different portraits, was portrayed by practically everybody. That's Leonardo da Vinci's portrait of her. The, uh, first there's a, a, a portrait in metal by Romano, then Leonardo, Titian, uh, Bellini, all kinds of people painted her portrait. She wrote tens of thousands of letters, which are currently being all translated and put up on the web in a wonderful website, in fact, about Isabella d'Este. So she's another example. Uh, in the Holy Roman Empire, so Germany, with its 400 or so separate territories, that offers even more examples of princely working couples like Isabella d'Este and her husband, Francesco Gonzaga, um, and women with significant political and cultural power. Although laws of succession in the Holy Roman Empire generally precluded women from ruling territories in their own right, especially in small states, women regularly served as regents during the minority of their sons and whenever their husbands are off on a territorial or imperial business or engaged in warfare, which is pretty often during this period. But, another but, just today tonight my talk is a series of buts, commanding queens and noble women were not limited to Europe in the early modern period. So Akbar is not the only ruler with whom Elizabeth can be compared out, that's from outside of Europe. In fact, the research of Ruby Lal on the Mughal court during Akbar's reign uh, has found many senior women, including Akbar's mother and aunt, who played important roles in political and cultural affairs, sometimes including public appearances. And this is one of his, this is Akbar's aunt, uh, Gulbuddin Banu Begum, a wonderful Mughal miniature, I think, here. She's smoking a hookah with her maidservant standing behind her. So this also says, it goes against one of our stereotypes. Yes, women smoked in this period, and they smoked hookahs. Uh, and Western women smoked, European women smoked pipes, and Chinese women smoked pipes. But we could go off on women and tobacco use, but that's not what we're talking about That, But this woman, uh, who's Akbar's aunt, led a large party of court women on the Hajj. So she left from, from the Mughal Empire and traveled to, to Mecca and Medina, which not only signified their personal religious devotion, as the Hajj does for any Muslim, but also demonstrated the power of the Mughal government and its devotion to Islam, which is a little suspect because, as some of you probably know, Akbar combined many different religious systems uh, ideas and was interested in all the religious traditions. So she and a whole bunch of women go off on the Hajj to show how devout Muslims are the people in, in the, the Mughal Empire are. Akbar also asked, later asked Gulbuddin to write a history of the founding of the Mughal dynasty that had been by her father Babur, which she did. Uh, so that's his grandfather. Um, so she writes one of the very first histories of the Mughal Empire. The text, the Huban Yumnama, is unique in eliminating the world of early modern Islamic kingdoms and cultures from a Muslim woman's perspective and provides gendered accounts of varied cross-border relationships, affiliations, and social arrangements that resulted from the sweeping thrust of early Mughal conquests. Her text was translated into English in 1901 by Annette Beveridge, one of the very earliest female scholars of India and England, so you could read it. 
um, and you can get it through Google Books. In fact, it's an old, you know, it's an old-fashioned English. It's written in 1901, but it's really quite wonderful. Some of you may also know Gulbuddin Bambagin from Salman Rushdie's fabulous novel, The Enchantress of Florence, in which she's one of the main characters, as are many other historical people at the Mughal, Ottoman, and Medici courts. So if you want a glimpse of what courtly life, in, life is like in this period, I'd really recommend reading The Enchantress of Florence. It may not be one if you teach younger students to advise to them. It's full of sex and intrigue, but that's what courts are like, so it's perfect for that. Um, so it's a great, it's a great novel. A really fun novel. Okay, although Gulen and Bonham Begum did not rule in her own right, she set a pattern followed later by several women in several states of northern India, especially the state of Bhopal, a large princely state founded in 1707 as the Mughal Empire fell apart. So it's one of those successor states to the Mughals in northern India. Women were the de facto or actual rulers of Bhopal throughout much of its history, beginning with Begum, and the word Begum, by the way, means queen, so it just means queen. Queen Amalo Bai, who ruled for over 50 years in the name of her two stepsons. She made decisions on military campaigns and all other administrative affairs when her stepsons concentrated on religious contemplation. So they go off and contemplate things and she runs the whole place. Between 1819 and 1926, so a little beyond the early modern period, four Muslim rulers reigned over Bhopal, the second largest Muslim state in India. Despite staunch opposition from powerful nobles and male claimants, all of whom wanted the throne and they said they shouldn't, weren't successful because they were women and the women were, one, were excellent rulers. Even the British India, East India Company initially opposed female rule in Bhopal until the Begums quoted Queen Victoria as their model and inspiration. So it's hard to fight against female rule when you're being ruled by a queen. Each Begum impressed her own personality on the role and succeeded in reigning over a mostly Hindu population. Shahir Khan's Begums of Bhopal, a dynasty of women rulers in Raj India, which you see here on the left, so this is the book, book cover, is a fascinating look at their lives, written for a general audience by a man who is a direct descendant of Bhopal's ruling family and a career diplomat. And it's something you could share with your students. I think it's a lot of fun. It's really a fun read. It views them very positively. There's not a lot of historical distance. They are his ancestors. But Khan understands the traditions that allow these women power very well. Second to last Begum of Bhopal, uh, Nawab Sultan John Begum, who ruled from 1861 to 1901, is also the subject of a new biography that you see here on the right, Muslim Women, Reform and Princely Patronage, Nawab Sultan John Begum of Bhopal, by Siobhan Lambert Hurley, who examines the ways that the Begum supported the emerging Muslim women's rights movement and introduced changes in terms of veiling, female education, marriage, motherhood, and women's political rights. I think, and again, it takes us beyond the early modern period, but it's part of the legacy of these women rulers. And I think this is very, it's a really good story, I think, to kind of uh, work against stereotypes that people have of uh, Islamic women uh, and women rulers. Another new biography of a commanding early modern queen, so this time back in the early modern period, by somebody with very deep understanding of the culture that she studies, is Leslie Pierce's absolutely brand new Empress of the East, I think it's just out for a month or so, how a European slave girl became queen of the Ottoman Empire, and you see it here on the left. Pierce, who has researched and written about women in the Ottoman Empire for 40 years, tells the remarkable story of a Christian slave girl, Roxelana, who you see it here on the cover, who was abdicated by slave traders from her Ruthenian homeland and brought to the harem of Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent in Istanbul. Suleiman fell deeply in love with her, something, by the way, that, that sultans were not supposed to do uh, with women in their harems, gave up all of his other concubines, and in an absolutely unprecedented step, he freed her and he married her, so he, she became his official wife. The bold and canny Roxolana soon became a shrewd diplomat and philanthropist who helped Suleiman keep pace with a changing world. Uh, the book you see here on the right, a more specialized book, not for general audience, more academic book, but just to talk about another uh, Ottoman, uh, powerful Ottoman woman, uh, Lucien Tysenicek, who works on the, the uh, Hadith Turhan Sultan, the mother of Sultan Mehmed, who rules in the late 17th century. Her work builds on that of Leslie Pierce in laying to rest any idea that the physical seclusion of Ottoman royal women, they are, yes, in, in the palace, but it, that didn't keep them from political, cultural, or indeed military activities. Uh, Sultana Turhan was enormously important as an architectural patron. You see the build, some of the buildings that she had built here on the cover. 
She commissioned both the Yenna Valida Mosque complex in the center of Istanbul, and if you've ever been to Istanbul, you've been there, and the four, two fortresses at the entrance to the Dardanelles. Building one of those fortresses was part of her efforts to help the Ottoman Empire ward off Venetian naval attacks in the eastern Aegean, which she also addressed through her correspondence with her viziers and other court officials, including the Admiral of the Mediterranean Navy. So here's the Sultana from her palace writing to the Admiral telling him what to do in terms of strategy and naval tactics. Turhan Sultan was thus key in building up both the actual power of the Ottoman Empire and the public representation of that power toward the outside. So again, performance and actual power. Okay. In the Ottoman and Mughal empires, the most political important women were mothers and wives of male rulers. But other Muslim states also saw independent female rulers. Barbara and Leonard Andaya have studied the firmly Muslim court of Aceh in northern Sumatra, which was governed by queens for nearly 60 years, from 1641 to 1699. The first of these queens, Taj al Alam, used the feminized title of Sultana, that's what she calls herself, and maintained a court that was astounding to Europeans for its pomp and magnificence. So they go there from the French court, which is pretty pompous and magnificent, and they see this court and they're just completely blown away. Similarly, in the Bugis Kingdom of South Sulawesi, which is now the Celebes, so these are all parts of contemporary Indonesia, women who were understood to carry the white blood of royalty could become ruling queens a pattern that continued into the 19th century long after the area had become Muslim. So across the Muslim world from the Ottoman Empire in the west to Aceh in the east, there are female rulers. In West Africa, okay, this is a, you know, as we do often in world history, we just, you know, travel around the world. Um, in West Africa, uh, the highest female leadership title is generally translated as Queen Mother. A woman who held this title was related through kinship to the man who held the title translated as king, but she was not necessarily his mother. So a queen mother doesn't necessarily mean biological mother. And she might have been chosen by the senior women of the royal lineage. So it's a sort of honorific title. Kings had the greatest authority, but queen mothers had institutionalized roles and formal functions, including the right to act as intercessors in legal cases, settle disputes among other women at court, and sometimes even to name and depose male rulers. One of the most powerful of these is the woman who's in my title of these queen mothers was Queen Amanatu, who's sometimes called Amana, Amina of Zauza, which is one of the house of city states in what is now Nigeria. She ruled from about 1536 to 1573 without a male co-ruler, so by herself as the queen. She expanded Zauza's political boundaries and trading networks led the traditional religion, which is called Bori, a religion centered on spirit possession, through which the royal family was thought to safeguard the health of the state, and became known as a warrior queen who led troops into battle herself. Thus, like her exact contemporary, Elizabeth I, so she's ruling from 1536, Queen Amina is, to 1573, the exact years of the beginning of Elizabeth's reign. Also, like Queen Isabella and Catherine the Great, Queen Amina, or Queen Aminatu, had broad power over religion as well as politics. Most of what we know about her is based on oral tradition, though. There are no contemporary portraits, and the earliest written source is about 1836, so well after her rule. But in the last few decades, she's become a very common subject in popular culture with lots and lots of lively stories. And here's a couple of examples of her sort of in contemporary popular culture. Here she is on the Nigerian stamp that celebrated International Women's Year in 1975. Uh, here she is at the top um, in a painting uh, by the Nigerian artist E. M. Kapei. And here she is at the bottom um, in a 1998 Budweiser ad. Um, those ads, some of you may know about those ads, that Budweiser ad is from a series of paintings and sort of mini histories called Great Kings and Queens of Africa commissioned from African-American artists by Budweiser from 1975 to 2000. So until quite recently, there was this whole series of them. And they're really quite interesting. You can go online and find them. Just type in Budweiser as Great Kings and Queens of Africa. Um, that series has been praised as helping African-Americans and others know about the African heritage. But it's Budweiser, so it's also been criticized as yet one more way to sell liquor and cigarettes to African-American communities. But I think the picture of her is really uh, quite wonderful here. 
she's also along with other sorts of things. Uh, here's Queen Amina, Queen, King Queen Amina, or excuse me, Queen Amina, uh, in the poster for a 2015 stage play uh, that was performed in Nigeria. Here she is uh, there from that that uh, portrait that you saw uh, in a quite well received stage play. Um, here she is. This is the statue I opened with my opening. Here's a, she is in a statue that's in Lagos. Um, riding a horse, a part of her military adventures, uh, and in a forthcoming film uh, that's going to be opening next year. You can see a trailer online, but not the whole film yet, um, by the Nigerian director, Izu Ojikua, who's part of this sort of Nollywood, which is the Nigerian Hollywood, like Bollywood is the Indian Hollywood. Um, okay, so this is things about Queen Amina. Similarly, too, in, in Benin and Oyo, Dahomey, and Asante, these are states that rose and fell in the early modern period in what's now Ghana and eastern Nigeria. Women held the title of queen mother and other offices that paralleled those of male leaders. Queen Adia of Benin was the mother of the king, he's called the Oba uh, Effigy, who came to the throne in 1504 after a long civil war with his brother and with neighboring peoples in which his mother's political and spiritual assistant were essential for him claiming the throne. In return, he created a new position within the court for her called the Ioba, or it translates usually again as Queen Mother, which gave her significant political privilege, privileges, including a separate resident with its own staff. Idia and later Iobas wielded considerable power. They were viewed as instrumental to the protection and well-being of the Oba, of the king, and by extensive to the well-being of the kingdom. Indeed, Obas wore carved ivory pendant masks representing the Ioba during ceremonies designed to rid the kingdom of malevolent spiritual forces. What you see here on the left is one of those ivory masks. It's not really meant to be a mask to go over the face, but a mask to serve as a pendant, um, believed to depict uh, Queen Adia herself. Uh, it's now in the Metropolitan Museum in New York City. The two vertical bars that you see of inlaid iron kind of between the eyes, right above her eyes there, are meant to sort of represent med medicine-filled incisions that were in her actual forehead that were one source of India's spiritual and medical power. Within the court, the Iobis political status was equal to that of a senior chief, so she's kind of second in command at court, and she enjoyed the right to commission precious works of art for personal and devotional use. Among those precious works were brass heads of rulers for which Benin has become famous. These are often used in teaching world history, the Benin bronze heads, like the one that you see here on the right. Uh, again, people think that this is probably, art historians think that this is probably Idia herself. So in the major forms of art uh, that are there in, uh, from, from Benin, uh, she's both represented, uh, she's depicted, and she's also a patron. She's the one that pays for these things uh, to, be, be, uh, to be produced. There isn't yet a book-length biography of Queen Amina or Queen Idia, but there is another brand new biography of another early modern African queen, Linda Haywood's Jinga of Angola, Africa's Warrior Queen. Jinga, who lived from 1583 to 1663, was the sister of the king, again, overlapping with Elizabeth's time. She was the sister of the king, sent by her brother as a diplomat in negotiations with neighboring countries and with the Portuguese, who are, of course, in Angola at this time. After her brother committed suicide, she took over as regent for her nephew, but she also began calling herself queen. In 1626, after being deposed by the Portuguese, she transformed herself into a ferocious military leader, you see here in this uh, painting on the cover, waging wars against the Portuguese colonizers and their African allies. Surviving multiple attempts to kill her, Jinga conquered the neighboring state of Matamba and ruled as queen of Dongo Matamba, which is part of present-day Angola. Toward the end of her life, weary of war, she made peace with Portugal and converted to Christianity, dying at age 80. And I think Linda Haywood is a well-known historia and of the Atlantic world. Uh, again, this is written for, it could be easily, um, I don't know for your students, but certainly written for a popular audience. It's really quite a wonderful book. Um, here's a more contemporary illustration of her, in fact, uh, in negotiations with the Portuguese governor. Uh, so that here she's sitting there uh, and negotiating with him, which is something that she actually did. <clears throat> Today, she's also, uh, like Queen Amina, is remembered in Angola for her political and diplomatic acumen, as well as her brilliant military tactics. Accounts of her life are often romanticized, and she's considered a symbol of the fight against all kinds of oppression.
She's revered as a national heroine, honored in folk religions, plays, coins, and statues. So here's uh, the poster from the 2013 film about her, and then a statue in Rwanda, Angola. So, where are we? <laughs> if you want to use biographical portraits in, as a world history lens, there are a range of materials and a number of commanding queens from many parts of the world. There's scholarly and popular book-length biographies of many of them, shorter biographies and reference works, like the ones I've given you from the Encyclopedia of Women in World History, and there's ones on the web, including Wikipedia. Uh, there are biopics, so uh, films about them, documentary films about them, fictionalized films, TV series, and even games. Most of these are for adults, but for some of these women, there are books specifically for young adult readers or even for younger readers. I'm going to kind of end it with an example of a couple of these. There's a fictionalized biography, in fact, of Jinga as a girl in the series The Royal Diaries, designed for middle school students. And maybe some of you who teach middle school know this series. Uh, it's, these are fictionalized biographies, but they're written as if they are, as if they are diaries. Jinga, Warrior Queen of Matamba, Angola, Africa, 1595 written by Patricia McKissick, is based on true historical events, places, people, and customs, as in, as in, and it's fairly accurate. That series also has similar fictionalized diaries from other girls who would become early modern queens, including Christina of Sweden, Catherine the Great, Isabella of Castile, Mary, Queen of Scots, and of course, Elizabeth, <laughs> of course. The series also has books on princesses, queens, and noble women from other periods and places, including Korea, Hawaii, Haiti, India, and Japan. The ones I've looked at in the series, I haven't looked at all of them, but I've looked at a couple, I think are fine, mostly written by experienced children's book authors. And in fact, the one on Anna Koana of Haiti, the wife of one of the island's rulers at the time of Columbus, is written by the renowned Haitian-American novelist Ed Edwidge Danticat, uh, who usually writes books that are absolutely not appropriate for children. Um, so this is not her usual fare, but she writes this. It's really, a, I think, quite a wonderful book. The series as a whole is certainly better than most series on princesses, which I've looked at, that are written for girls. There are lots of those series, almost all of them, which only talk about Europeans. So most series aren't even as diverse as Disney heroines, and this series uh, is, and I think not bad. Yeah. And I don't, I'd like to find out if any of you happen to have used any of these in your classroom. I'd really like to hear about that. So wherever you find their stories, it's clear that female rulers were central figures in the large and small states of the early modern world, from Versailles, where, there, where queens, in fact, could not rule in their own right, but there were plenty of, queen, of, queen, of queens who were married to kings, to Brunei, all the way over uh, in what's now Indonesia and perhaps even beyond the stem of America as well, as some new research that's not really out yet, just beginning to come out on Maya courts, so courts in the Maya kingdoms and the Maya city-states, it's beginning to suggest that some of those were ruled by, female, by women as well. So in the Western Hemisphere as well as in the Eastern Hemisphere. Elizabeth I is fascinating and unusual, for she, but she had what I think of as many sisters who rivaled her in political ability, intelligence, and power. So. Uh, what's in just a, little, a few things, what's, what's in the packet of readings, uh, if you want to read more about the number of these women, so there's, and you see the, um, the information about that. Um, there's just short overviews from, or short biographies of six of the women that I've talked about tonight. Mm -hmm. And then there's two speeches of Queen Elizabeth I. Um, her, what did I include in here? She gave a lot of speeches on this. Uh, her Tilbury speech, which is the, uh, speech that she gave or is recorded as having given uh, after the defeat of the Spanish Armada um, when uh, she goes out and says uh, sort of the most famous quote from her, I, I know I have the body of a, of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king and a king of England too. Uh, if you've seen various Elizabeth movies, somebody always says that particular speech. Um, <laughs> and then uh, the other speech that's included in the packet is the golden speech that's given at the very end of her reign, uh, when, she's in, uh, at, when Parliament had wanted her to do something, and she said, uh, no, she wouldn't do this. Uh, and she really talks there about the way that she's been a good ruler to you. Um, I didn't, I, I've always done things in your favor. So I think that they're, they're, both of these are quite short, um, and both of them I think you could use the students uh, to talk about the way that women, the female rulers understood themselves uh, and, and what they did. So, questions?
questions? Uh, oh, Mary, thank you so much. That was marvelous. And um, thank you for referring us back also to those um, terrific primary sources you shared. Um, the, um, the speeches are really fascinating, I think, and have a lot, uh, a lot of rich um, points of interpretation. And thank you for that um, marvelous overview um, and, and exploration of global, a global look um, at, at, at female rulership. I want to um, invite our participants to um, share any questions that you have or comments that you'd like to make in the um, chat box. And this is a good time to add them in. Um, and in the meantime, I have um, many questions of my own. So um, I wonder first if I could um, ask you, Mary, to expand a little bit on the question of, um, of military um, uh, authority and um, and military uh, leadership uh, among women it's I think we see in the Elizabeth speech a lot of diplomacy and 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 tact in her dealing with um, men in the court and um, and lords and 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 trying to be sure to kind of assert political authority but um, you've mentioned on a number in a number of instances that women were exercising not just diplomacy but also um, Military um, practices and and military authority. Can you talk a little bit about a little bit more about that cross culturally, or um, how much we know about whether there's some examples of that um, that we can uh, that you can that throw some light on that what to us in our own time is sort of an unlikely combination as we look back at the early modern era. Sure. I mean, I think that. Uh do you want to try putting your video on, okay. Mary, so we can <laughs> yeah. <laughs> see if that works? Is that working? I think it's going to load. Yep, yep. I think it okay. it's going to load. <laughs> um, hi. Hi. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, certainly probably the most famous examples of women actually leading troops and being troops was in the Kingdom of Dahomey in West Africa, which again it's an example that's often used in world history of an all-female battalion uh, that seems that existed and it was there. It's not normal, it's not usual uh, that women do, do the actual leading of troops, uh, but certainly the several of the queens that I talked about from Africa did this. Um, but it, but what is more more usual, and this again maybe might be even more surprising to people. I mean, Elizabeth did put on a breastplate occasionally. We think that maybe, but it was ceremonial. I mean, she would show up. Um, the the Tilbury speech, for example, is is uh, was given. Elizabeth, her troops were. I mean, the Spanish Armada. Uh, was this large Spanish inv attempted invasion of England, but it was a disaster for the Spanish. Um, and mostly it was a disaster because of bad winds, but it was also a disaster because of, of a whole variety of other kinds of things. But at, at the at one point, the, the English didn't realize it was going to be such a disaster and really feared that there was going to be a Spanish land invasion and an invasion of England, um, that the Spanish would land, would land in England. And uh, most of Elizabeth's troops are down at a little place called Tilbury near on the, on the coast. And Elizabeth did actually physically go down there. She did actually, like you see in the movies, Kate Blanchett, if you get that one, or any other older Elizabeth movie, uh, you know, rode a horse, wore, a, wore a ceremonial armor, at least a breastplate, um, and did speak to her troops from the back of the horse. So she's actually, or, or standing. There. So she's actually reviewing the troops down there and kind of bucking them up. Um, but what she does also do is that she and other, even again, women who are at the Ottoman court, uh, they're in women at the Ottoman court are not certainly out actually reviewing the troops or out actually fighting battles, but they're working with their generals and their admirals even to think about military strategy, to what should they do, where should the troops go, how many troops should go where, uh, what are the most important things, so that they were actively um, engaged in the military, not battlefield tactics, but military strategy. And because, of course, in this period, the fastest anything could go on sea is sailing, and the fastest anything could go on land is in a wagon or riding a horse. Um, 
where you put your troops and how many of your troops at what particular times was really, really mattered because you couldn't just decide, oh, well, we need now we need a bunch more people over here. We made a really bad decision about where troops should go. So that these kind of large scale strategies are something that, um, that women are actively involved in. And I think that's something that, um, that surprises people when they hear about, hear about this. Uh, certainly the, uh, the qu various queens of, of, uh, Western Europe are involved in this. Uh, uh, various rulers of the small states in Germany are involved in this. Catherine the Great, of course, is definitely involved in planning military strategies on a very large scale. Again, not on the battlefield, but on a large scale, deciding which general is going to get how many troops where, um, so that women are engaged in these kind of military decisions. Uh, quite who, the, women who are rulers uh, quite quite regularly. Um, and in Africa, I mean, there are certainly examples that women, this is not just kind of myth that's been told, but women were actually uh, physically leading troops uh, out in, um, in, uh, out in the, um, yep. uh, you, know, you know, on the thing. So and I just saw some kind of a question come up. Yes. We have we have some terrific questions, and I think um, why don't we take you know I think a really good tie-in um, is the one that um, Corinne asked. So we'll, and we'll we'll come back to um, to the others as well. But um, Corinne Kurtz uh, notes says I was curious about pushback against female rule during this time period. Would comparisons to modern times, thinking Hillary, work in this? <laughs> <laughs> you have some comments on that, Mary? Sure. How long do you want me to talk? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I think that really, the, the, again, I, I refer to sort of the, what's called, usually called the Knox debate or the debate about female rule. And we have more about this from Western Europe than we have from anywhere else. So I don't want to sort of say, oh, let's always talk about Western Europe. Um, but Western Europe, it, there is an unusual number of female rulers in Western Europe in the 16th century. I mean, it just, it just happens that a number of, you know, guys died and people either had children or didn't have children, and there are lots and lots of actual female rulers. Um, like Isabella II, Mary, Mary Queen of Scots, Mary Tudor, Elizabeth, um, assorted Habsburgs, just lots of female, uh, female rulers, and it has clearly bothered the guys. Um, and so that there, what starts up is a whole debate about female rule that is not just some theoretical thing. It's because and it's very clear that, I mean, big intellectual debates like this, oh, can women do this and can women do that, uh, don't come out of nowhere. They come because women, in fact, are doing this and that. Um, <laughs> so that, you know, the big debate about what, should women get an education that occurs in the 19th century, um, or will it shrink their uteruses if they go to the university? You know, university or the uterus was the kind of thing. Um, it's not because it's some guy sitting back and some is theoretically thinking about this. It's because women are pushing to go to the university. Um, so that these are responses to what's actually going on, not just responses to theory. And I think that certainly there are, mm. uh, there is, as we have seen, um, sexism is something that is very deeply ingrained. Um, that said, our, our system today, because it's not a monarchy, I mean, the other thing I think I sort of referred at the beginning to the sort of um, class versus gender issue with these women. These women, most of them, are hereditary monarchs. Their father was a king or their grandfather was a king. In other words, they come from the family that people expected to be the ruler. Now, of course, we have dynasties now. We've had two Bushes and we've, um, we've had two Adams in, in thinking about presidents. Um, you know, we, we had adopters for, for, other, for more than that. But, uh, but we don't really... It, it, monarchies are given that we don't really feel that people have uh, have have the royal blood flowing through their veins, which people did feel in this period. So, the debate, even for with Elizabeth, was you know that she was uh, or Henry, I mean Henry VIII's various children. Um, I mean Henry VIII had children out of wedlock, but because they didn't have uh, you know the royal blood that came down through the line of a of a of a marriage, uh, they were excluded and, and the girls were included. So, so it's a different system, I think, here now with the democracy um, than with something that, uh, with this kind of a system. And, and in some ways, hereditary monarchies are, allow female rule in ways that, uh, that democracies don't. I always tell my students, in fact, that we don't make a big deal about women getting the vote in the 20th century 
but uh-huh. women in, who lived in convents in medieval Europe um, voted for their abbess um, back in the 12th century. So women were voting for the people who had charge of their lives uh, centuries earlier than we think of it. So it's good to look back. <laughs> oh, that's and, great and an example of that. Thank you so much for that answer. I have to occasionally be careful about the making quite as many parallels with modern things as I want to. <laughs> <laughs> we hear <Maybe>. that. <laughs> so, K-12 uh, teacher as well. Yeah, Mary, so Tyrius wanted, yeah. <laughs> had a great question about peri- yeah. uh, uh, the, the period, too. He wrote, why do you think so many of the historic examples were contemporaries of Elizabeth? Is there something special about this? This um, these centuries, this this transitional time in Eurasia and Africa, um, and perhaps in other parts of the world too, is that or is that just historians looking for multiple examples for a narrative? What do you think about that? Is this a time period where we see more flux and opportunity for women to rule, or um, or not so much to think of it that way? Um. You know, I, th- I think this, the situation in, in Western Europe is accidents. I mean, it really is accidents of birth and death. Um, it just so happened. It's not, it wasn't kind of an intentional aim by anybody. And, you know, have had, had Henry VIII had sons that lived, had, you know, the rulers of Spain had sons that lived, uh, then there wouldn't have been all these rulers. So, in partly, it's just, it's just that. Um, and in partly, I think it's also a question of sources, why it's now and not in earlier periods. There may very well have been female rulers in earlier time periods, but we don't know about them very much. Um, so it's in this period that in many different places, we begin to get more and more written sources, more and more kinds of evidence, more and more sources that you can date. Uh, so that, I think, is part of it, rather than that there was either <laughs> something in the air um, or, or anything like that. And in some cases, too, this is also a period of time, and I'll, I'll you know, kind of go back to my point about hereditary monarchies. This is, a before, time, this is a period of time in which most people in the world who lived in large states lived under hereditary monarchs. Uh, they, didn't, they weren't democracies. It's before those Atlantic revolutions, which mean that no women rule <laughs> for a long period of time. Um, you know, uh, so that, uh, which of course, have very deep restrictions on gender. Um, so that I think that's a combination of sources appear for the first time, which is, explains why there, we don't know so many earlier, although there are women rulers, you know, back to Hatshepsut in ancient Egypt and certainly Sumerian women. Um, and uh, so the women rulers in the classical period and even River Valley civilizations too. Um, and there are there are fewer than in the period with the beginning of, of elected um, elected governments because those elected governments exclude women from uh, being able to be uh, be an official. So I think it's partly sources and partly that there's still are lots of monarchies around. Oops, great. Um, so here's a, here's a wonderful question also that brings in the topic of religion, and I know that's a uh, very central to your work as well. Catherine has asked, Catherine Rosenal has asked, I'm curious as to your thoughts about why there seem to be more female leaders as military leaders in West Africa. Could it be religious in nature, since they were typically not worshipping the, the um, major religions, was mostly pre-Christian, um, uh, and were they perhaps coming from more egalitarian um, religious traditions or cultures? Yeah, I, I, that's a really good question, and I think the answer is again, I'm not an African historian, uh, but but, but I, it, the the answer is yes to some degree. Uh, although Queen Jinga becomes a, converts to Christianity, well, though late in life, um, but I think very much uh, like again the, the Queen idea who you see here uh, from Benin here, the wonderful uh, copper um, or bronze head here. Uh, these are women, the queen mothers, so again, this is a sort of ritual role, are often in, in West Africa, they're sort of in charge of or they're really important in these tr- traditional religions, uh, various kinds of traditional indigenous African religions. They're important for, un- that they're under- it's understood that they have a role to protect the king, to protect the kingdom, they play their in cer- r- rituals and ceremonies. Uh, they do, ver- do various kinds of special ceremonies just for them. So I think that, uh, yes, the answer is in West Africa that the traditional religion 
does give women a kind of opportunity that they don't have in in some world religions. Um, which is why, although I also on the on the flip side, that's why I wanted to include so many uh, women from the, from the Muslim world, uh, because again, uh, certainly Islam is not a religion that has a formal you know, priestly role or imam role or anything for women in this particular period. Um, there are certainly gender differences within Islam uh, and the fact that then, so women are not playing a religious role as they are in West Africa um, in terms of carrying out rituals or other things, but they're certainly supporting religion. They're providing money and patronizing mosques. Um, with Alita Sultana, who's, uh, who's the, the mosque that you saw on the cover of the book, uh, I mean, she that's a hospital and a mosque, uh, and she uh, patronizer has that built in central Istanbul. So they're important. The Muslim women are important as um, as supporters of religion, um, but they don't get their power through their connection with the with the divine the way queens do in West Africa. Mm. But I think certainly indigenous religion uh, does play an, an important role in that. And Linda Haywood's book and Linda Haywood's earlier studies. Um, Linda and, and she, Linda and, and her husband John Thornton have, have really written a lots of wonderful books about cultural and social exchange and in the African world and in the in West Africa and in the Atlantic world. Um, and I think that their her work particular is really rich about the role that, um, that women play in traditional religions. Wonderful. Um, I, I have a, a question to Mary. I wonder. Um, and this, we might need another webinar seminar for this topic, so maybe we'll do that this next year. But I wonder if you um, can give us any guidance in thinking about this question of whether um, whether the lives of or experiences of um, what we know about these um, most elite women, women in command, um, can give any um, glimpses into um, what life was like. For or non-elite women, or really anything about them, or, or is it possible to draw any inferences from um, from what we can learn from these courtly um, uh, scenarios that you have um, outlined for us this evening? Yeah, I mean, it's always I don't know. I, I mean, I first started, started my life as a historian of a historian of, as a historian of working women in, in the 16th century. So when I <laughs> sort of started to talk about elite women, I always had this kind of nagging, oh, I shouldn't really be talking about this. Girl. I should be talking about seamstresses and midwives and such. And I still talk about them some. But you know, when you are back, looking back into the 500 years ago, the issue of sources becomes paramount, and trying to find out more about the lives of ordinary women, and really anywhere in the world in any period, it's always, of course hard to find sources about the lives of, of ordinary people, especially ordinary women, and I'll, I'll do, and I know that Angela Lee is on this, and there may be as well other AP people that in the old format of the AP World History test in the DBQ, the question was always what source isn't here and what voice would we want to hear, and you could always answer a peasant woman, that because there were never any peasant women, I mean, it, just, it became a sort of joke, and no matter what the topic the source was a source by a peasant woman was never there. I think we finally ended up with one question over many years that actually had an actual agricultural, you know, a woman who worked in agriculture as one of the sources and was like, oh my, well, you know. So, so it becomes kind of a joke. And I don't mean to make it a joke. But it is, it is certainly something that's, because that's where I started as, as a social historian about thinking about ordinary, about ordinary women. Um, and most of these queens, I will certainly say, you know, one wishes that Elizabeth I were were some kind of pro-woman person. She's absolutely not. I mean, she she is a ruler, first of all, um, and undersells herself as Henry's daughter. Um, she certainly had a rather tumultuous childhood, you know, seeing <laughs> your father kill your mother when you're uh, an infant. Well, she was didn't see it. But, so there's all sorts of reasons for that. But but they're, so they're, the royal women tend to, in general, not be kind of proto-feminists or it was people who were trying to make women's ordinary women's lives any easier, any better, or anything like that, or make things more egalitarian. They're simply not. Um, but again, that's asking people who lived 500 years ago to have a sensibility that we have now, or that some of us have now. Um, you know, this, uh, we can lapse into political discussion again of the contemporary scene. Um, but, but, but I think there still are things that you can 
find out about certain aspects of their lives. Uh, for example, getting back to West African religion, I mean, these uh, traditional religions were ones that were practiced by um, quite, uh, you know, the, the whole range of the population. Um, so they might have seen the woman, uh, seen, the, seen the queen engage in some kind of ritual activity or something like that. Another thing I think about co the court is this, all of this ritual and display and such that I sort of started with. Why these are theater states? Well, theater states have to have an audience and people wanted to see, as we do today, today with celebrity culture, people wanted to see rulers. So rulers engaged in many of their activities out in, sort of in public. Um, and not all of those did, certainly ones that are more secluded, say, in the Ottoman Empire. Both the Sultan and the uh, Sultana are not out in public. But in many, many places they are. They were never alone. They were always out in public. People watched royalty at dinner. They watched them go back and forth. They were everywhere. So that one of the things that, that people would have been able to see, see these various people, and you can kind of get a sense about what was important to people a little bit from what they would have seen. Um, you know, their ordinary lives are, of course, not, their lives are not like, um, not like those of kind of ordinary women at all. Um, you know, and, and as we so comment often in women's history, the further down the social scale you go, the more similar the lives of men and women get. So you get to the very bottom when there's equality of misery. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> when people's life circumstances are shaped more by the fact that they don't have food to eat than by their gender. Um, so I, I don't know quite, it's sort of different in different situations. Uh, you can tell a lot about, you can tell certain things about religious practices, about some th uh, things about daily life, about some things, uh, but their lives are really very different than the, than the lives of, of, of ordinary women. Um, although at the court there would have been relatively ordinary women as well because along with court ladies and high nobles and such there would have been performers of one kind or another uh, there would have been depending on the kind of marital structure a whole range of concubines and women who danced and women who are musicians and women who are servants of one kind or another and women who cleaned up and women who did this and so and such and I would kind of in fact really recommend on that there's a collection in the book of uh, this the group of readings that I, I kind of read more about it. Um, mm -hmm. There's really a, a wonderful collection edited by Ann Waltall called Servants of the Dynasty, Palace Women in World History. Um, it's a series of essays. There's scholarly essays, but you might be able to really pull out some things that are really quite interesting. There, a few of those are about queens, but they're also about all of the different women that were in palaces. I mean, these palaces very often had mm -hmm. thousands of people living in them, so that they were, mm -hmm. again, everything from... Um, from the queen herself uh, down to somebody who is a scholarly maid or who turned the spit or who, you know, worked basically as, as a, some kind of a, of a cleaner or such like that. Um, even, I'll say, I'll put in a little plug that you mentioned when you introduced me. Uh, I wrote a book about a family of, of unusually hairy people. Yeah. Queen, there were three girls. And they spent most of their life at court. Uh, they lived at the French court, um, this family of people. Um, who have this disease where or this genetic abnormality where they're extremely hairy. Uh, they lived at the French court uh, with, uh, when it was being ruled by Catherine de' Medici, um, and then they lived at one of the uh, courts in northern Italy. So they spent mo then they end up later on. So that these young hairy women um, had spent all of their lives at court um, and were there. Uh, and that's so there's there's that's not an ordinary life <laughs> by any means, uh, but. But there were all kinds of people uh, of various social statuses in any of these courts because they need so many workers. <laughs> that was a wonderful answer. Thank you. It's really um, a lot of nuance. And there I, d I did think in the, uh, one of the couple of the wonderful paintings that you shared that there were some glimpses of other lives there, mm -hmm. like Gulbadan's servants behind her back and um, yep. the women in the dancing scene. So that really um, gives us some direction uh, to think about. And I'm so glad you mentioned the marvelous Harry girls because I was going to ask you to talk a little bit about <laughs> more about that. But I think, again, we'll have to return to this subject next year. I think we should close out with Angela Lee's very good question here. Um, Angela asked, your opinion on a good world history textbook that integrates the stories of women into the main narrative, or are there any good world history textbooks that you think do that more successfully than others? She notes that many textbooks still seem imbalanced and their coverage of women is certainly not global in scope. Do you have something to recommend to us, Mary? 
Well, I mean, it depends on what you want as a textbook. <laughs> um, if you want to just, and I'll, I sort of sort of like I'm doing shameless plugs for my own, <laughs> for my own books right now, but oh, whatever. You, you opened it up, Angela, so I'll just do a shameless plug. <laughs> um, but what I try to do, in fact, in I mean, I have a book that's just about that called Gender and uh, Gender in, in, in History: Global Perspectives. So it's just about issues having to do with women and gender. That's organized that people use as a textbook on, on co at college level courses. Um, and I just wrote my concise history of the world was is my attempt to write a social and cultural world history after complaint. It's not really a textbook, but you could use it for, for I think, and I tried to write it with a sort of advanced AP students and college students in mind, and it's being used in some college classrooms now. Um, you know, it doesn't have the format of a textbook. It's not big and glossy and such, it, it, but it's organized chronologically um, from Paleolithic to now. Um, and what I did, like pre-Paleolithic, to the nod to the big history folks. Um, but what I did try to do is I have been for a long time complaining that um, world history is too much material, sort of material economy. It's too much about men and ships going from place to place, um, and too much about m male elites. Um, and so I've been complaining about that for quite some time. And I thought, well, okay, I'm just going to quit complaining and try to write a social and cultural world history. Um, so that's a world history where I try to integrate. It's not just about women and gender, but there's a lot. It's me writing. So, um, mm -hmm. And also, if you're writing about social and cultural things, um, that it's, it, has that, it, it has a lot of, of, of gender in it and about, about the family and about some of the things I've talked about. A few of the women that are in here that, uh, that I talked about today are in it. Um, but I would say, Angela, you know, try it. Um, you might be able to use parts of it with your students. Uh, it is arranged chronologically. Uh, so. Um, and uh, it's from Paleolithic to, to well, to two years ago, <laughs> to almost now. And so that like so that might be, <laughs> be a thing. It sounds like great advice, Mary. Thank you. And again, I do think this is a topic we need to return to. I'll put in a plug for a primary source um, upcoming uh, learning opportunity, which is a one-day program coming up this spring in the month of March. Not, not purposely so, but it is Women's History Month, and we are doing Weaving Women into World History Narratives. So Angela's question was very timely um, in that sense. Uh, we are. We have um, just been riveted by your answers to um, the many great questions that participants asked. Um, uh, and thank you so much for those, Mary. I want to be cognizant of our time. And I'm just going to quickly um, take you on a whirlwind tour here of a few resources. The honest truth is that there aren't the wonderful, rich, um, fascinating, uh, accessible sources for teaching women in world history yet that we need to teach this um, really effectively and um, with a lot of engagement for students. So um, Mary and I kind of racked our brains and came up with, the, with, a, with a few that we wanted to point out to you. And, and you will have these in, um, your, in the PowerPoint and um, can refer back to them. But um, as always, I begin with uh, primary source resource guides, where you'll find a number of interesting um, texts and sources, including websites and um, primary documents on gender and history in our 60 plus different um, thematic world history in global studies resource guides. The, um, the images um, from the Neen that you shared um, this evening, Mary, of course, come from the Metropolitan Museum's uh, timeline of art history, which is a rich and excellent source for many of the different civilizations that you spoke about and um, many others as well. And there are some. Um, in, topics, subtopics, and essays, and certainly uh, countless images of the female, the female figure and female um, personages in many different roles throughout world cultures and, and world across time. Um, so that is a, a great go-to resource. We wanted to mention Women in World History, the website from the excellent Center for History and New Media at George Mason University. and. I was excited in, in working with Mary and planning this evening to um, discover that Mary herself has been very involved in this process and they're doing a new um, a 3.0, 2.0 version of this website, I guess. Do you want to say anything about that project, Mary? 
Um, <coughs> am I on the mic or not? I just can't remember. Yes, I am. Okay. Yep, you're um, on. Yeah, it's, I mean, this is in the, it is planning stages and what this will be. So I'm working with the people uh, at, at Kelly Schramm at the Center for Student Media and some other people around. And Angela, you heard a little bit about this over the summer. It's now be, it's something that we, we're calling World History Commons. That's the, its current iteration. We're writing an NEH grant proposal. Let's hope there's an NEH. Let's hope there's a federal budget. You know, thinking about mm-hmm. current political issues in the future, going in the future. Um, but but to bring all of the not just this one, uh, but as you know, many of you I'm sure know, Center for History and New Media uh, has a whole range of websites about world history. Uh, but they're now showing their age. They're more than a decade old. Some of them 15 years old. Um, to bring all of those into the current, into into more current form, to make them much more user, user friendly, to bring them all into one big umbrella, um, and to develop new content for uh, things that are not covered in any of their wonderful websites, but still to use the same, in many ways, same, the same kind of, of things. We're using primary sources and having people talk about them and, and try to make them really exactly what. Uh, what world and global historians at every level, teachers, researchers, uh, people new to the field, people old to the field, people who need something tomorrow, <laughs> you know, um, it so often <laughs> happens in world history, um, but using newer kinds of software uh, that make them more user friendly uh, and arranging things so that they're more easily accessible. So we're currently writing a proposal to the NEH for developing this, um, and we hope that that the NEH is going to be there um, and that we will uh, be able to uh, to develop uh, what we're calling at this point uh, World History Commons. Uh, it will be completely open source, available to everybody. We also hope to be able to draw in material from uh, people around the world so that it's, uh, it's both uh, useful for people around the world and also draws in the increasing amount of riches that are available online from all over the world that people, I mean, the Metropolitan Museum is fabulous, but we all keep kind of going back to the same sources over and over again, and mm-hmm. we should be able to be more mm-hmm. open in a variety of ways. Right, so that's, that's like the yeah. digital coming, library. Well, we, we're coming, coming soon, we hope. <laughs> yes, thank you. Not so soon, yes, but thank yeah. you for your service to, to the World History community in that regard. That's very exciting, and we'll all keep our fingers crossed. Um, Women in World History Curriculum is an old, um, now older, but I think still valuable collection. And I finally wanted to bring you to this slide. Um, they, these are some reading recommendation, recommendations for further learning, for your further learning from Mary herself. And I couldn't even get all of the great suggestions onto a single slide. So at the bottom, you have a Google Doc link that will take you directly to the um, uh, the document, the full document, and there are some really fascinating books that I'm excited to read on that list. We um, are ready to close out our session together this evening, but I see again that we are going to need to spend more time with you in the future, Mary, so we thank you so (laughs) much for this really, really engaging, entertaining, and fascinating glimpse of um, women across the world at a particular moment and interesting set of, of centuries and um, some really interesting figures, some familiar and some much less so, um, and some great ways of thinking about how to put that history together for students. So we thank you so much and um, thank you all for joining us for this series to our teacher participants. And um, we will hope to meet up with you again very soon. Thanks, everybody, and good night. Thanks, Susan. <laughs>